I'm so glad that you're here. And of course, you have decided to kick off the campaign in many respects with, in, with respect to abortion. Yeah. We're wondering, though, what could you accomplish in a second term that you have not already done now? Well, to get there, we're going to require everyone to vote to understand what's at stake right now. And, um, and that is no small matter. Mm -hmm to make sure that um, we are present and I intend to travel around our country to remind people of what's at stake and that their voice will matter and will be expressed through their vote in many other ways. But we have to first get there. So I want to emphasize that point. Um, in terms of a second term, there's a lot of work to continue to, to do to build on our successes. We have, for example, capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month for our seniors. Uh, for years, our seniors have been talking about the fact that they had to make the awful decision about whether they could either fill their prescription or fill their refrigerator. But we with finally respect, capped the Excuse me, with respect yeah. to abortion in particular, I know this is a very big, important issue right now, and voters have been looking at it in previous elections as a time to turn out. It's something you're very passionate about in terms of freedom and choice. Okay, sure, to no, that yeah, issue, sure, we can talk about choice. Yeah, with yeah. respect to that issue in yeah. particular, what could not have been done during the first term that you require a second to accomplish? So the first thing that has to happen on the issue of abortion and choice and, and freedom for reproductive care is that we need to, in the next 10 months, do everything we can to remind people that the court, the Supreme Court, took a constitutional right from the people of America, from the women of America, and the United States Congress has the power and ability to put that right back in place, to put back in place the protections of Roe v. Wade into law. Can Congress do it without having necessary votes on well, either side? Well, again, we are here in January, yeah. and I'm going to tell you, in these intervening months between now and the election, I am going to do exactly what I'm doing here in Wisconsin, which is traveling the country to remind people of not only what is at stake and the harm that is occurring every day, so many women silently suffering, but also remind them of the connection between their vote and an outcome that puts back in place the protections of Roe. So these months are going to matter. And as I have said on this issue, one does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree. The government should not be telling women what to do with their bodies. And realistically, in the over a year that has passed since the Dobbs decision came down, women are silently suffering. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Megan, who was in the auditorium when I was speaking, who wanted a, to have a child, wanted to follow through with her pregnancy, but was diagnosed with a fetal condition such that that she had to have an abortion but her doctor could not provide what he knew she needed for the best interest of her health care she had to travel to Minnesota he couldn't even secure I think you said two signatures from Correct. physicians to At, try to get others to say he could provide it in her home state because under the law in Wisconsin at that time he could not as her physician make the decision without having two other physicians sign on in states like Texas, they've passed laws that include providing for up to, to life in prison for health care providers for doing their job of providing health care as they deem appropriate and necessary. There are states that have passed and, or proposed laws, both passed and proposed laws, that make no exception even for rape and incest, which means after someone has survived a, a crime of a violation to their body, a crime of, of violence to their body, these extremists are saying to that survivor, and you don't have the authority to make a decision about what happens to your body next. It's immoral. When you, when you were a prosecutor, this mm -hmm. was an extraordinary focus, crimes yes. against women, and children. violence against and children. Yeah. I know you've been very passionate about this for a very long time yes. in a variety of different fields. Yes. But I do wonder, when you talk about the states in particular, mm -hmm. You hold Trump responsible for the, the nomination of three Supreme Court justices who you believe intended at all times to then overturn this important precedent, as you say. 51 years later, here we are with it now being in past tense. If it's a state-related issue, is the election or candidacy and campaign of Trump as important? 
Well, let's first be clear that the previous president expressed his intentions quite clearly. And, the, and fast forward to just recently, mm -hmm. says he's proud of what he did. And let's be clear. So by inference, he is proud that women have been deprived of fundamental freedoms to make decisions about their own body. By inference, proud that doctors are being penalized and criminalized for providing health care. Proud that women are silently suffering because they don't have access to the health care they need. So let's understand that the stakes are so very high. Mm -hmm. And listen, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden has been very clear. When Congress puts the protections of Roe back into the law, he will sign it. Similarly, President Joe Biden has been very clear. If these extremists get achieve their other goal, which is to have a national ban, which means state by state by state, Joe Biden will veto that. The stakes are high. Speaking of the stakes being quite high, let's go to the border because yeah. this is something that is in your direct wheelhouse. It has been something that you have been looked to to try to accomplish what has been, frankly, a decades-long endeavor by successive presidential administrations. But there is anger on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, about an unsustainable border, what they're calling a crisis. Why can't this be accomplished during this administration? Well, so there is no question that our immigration system is broken. And so much so that we, as the first bill that we offered after our inauguration, was to fix the immigration system, which included what we must do to create a pathway for citizenship, Mm -hmm. and to put the resources that are needed into the border. But sadly, people on the other side of the aisle have been playing politics with this issue. The solutions are at hand. And, you know, gone are the days, sadly, where a President Bush or John McCain understood that we should have a bipartisan approach to fixing this problem, which is a long-standing problem. But what are those solutions? The solution includes putting resources at the border to do what we can to process people effectively and putting in place laws that actually allow for a meaningful, meaningful pathway to citizenship. And yet there's progressives who are very angry about, progress, about dreamers, about a pathway to citizenship not being included in the latest negotiations on these issues. Well, well I, I, I won't gone. speak to the current negotiations and the status of the current no negotiations, but I will tell you that dreamers under, sadly, the, some of the draconian approaches to them have been treated very badly mm -hmm. and that we have to understand who our dreamers are. First of all, in the height of the pandemic, it was so many dreamers who are frontline workers it's true. and working on saving lives. Um, dreamers who, many of them, before they could walk or talk, were brought into the country and, and have lived very productive lives, serving in our military, serving in Fortune 500 companies. And they should be honored for the, 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 the contribution they are making, and they should be protected. You've cared about this issue even before you were the vice president. Absolutely. It's, it's very dear to your heart. Yes. And yet you look at it, and if this is not something that can be accomplished now in this administration, I don't know how many bites of the apple you think you'll be able to get. Have you given that some thought? I will tell you that the negotiations that are happening right now, I hope, are going to be directed at solutions that are genuinely focused on fixing the problem, including all the equities that you mentioned. I do wonder about something that obviously you are really well known for. I mean, you are somebody who, aside from being the vice president, you have run a Department of Justice that's second only in the United States, Department of Justice in size yeah. and frankly stature. Mm -hmm. um, we remember you very well from your Senate and all the work you're doing on the different committees mm -hmm. and making your voice heard. And yet there is someone right now, if the polling is correct, has 91 counts, four different jurisdictions with different indictments and different case, cases against him, who could very well be the Republican nominee. And yet he is attacking you and President Biden for election interference. He believes what, what the Justice Department is doing is only attributed to you, 
but also is election interference. What is your reaction to those who believe his statements? Okay, well, let's start with the facts. You just outlined them, mm -hmm. so actually I don't need to repeat them um, in terms of what has have been the allegations about the former president. And I do believe that the American people care about rule of law and care about speaking truth and acknowledging truth. I do believe in my travels around our country that, for example, a statement that suggests that insurrectionists who attacked our capital and, and committed acts of violence should not be called patriots, as the former president has done. Um, should they be called candidates? Well, the people who attacked on January 6th should not be called patriots. The, what they did is they attacked our capital, they committed acts of violence, and they need to be taken into account and held accountable for those acts. So these are just facts, and um, we are going to see what happens in terms of any cases that are being litigated in a court of law. But what about the accusation that, you, that it is Biden's DOJ that is overseeing any of the charges against him? Well, listen, everyone who is paying close attention understands that there is a clear and, and, and non-negotiable division in terms of the separation between our administration and what the Department of Justice does in terms of its investigations, in terms of its prosecutions. And that line has never been crossed. Did that also intend and include what's going on in Georgia? Obviously, you were a state prosecutor. This is the federal government we're talking about. But there are those who try to conflate what DA Fannie Willis is doing in Georgia with the acts of the Department of Justice. What's the question? The question is, do you believe that when Donald Trump is making these statements to suggest this is all attributed to the Biden administration or to the Department of Justice, what is your response to people who believe that, in fact, it's all orchestrated as one? Well, what he is saying is not factual, period. Period. And th that would not be new for him, would it? <laughs> I wonder when you look at the rule of law, as you've mentioned, and I do think the American public is very well in tune with discussions surrounding who is above the law and who is not. These phrases come out very easily now. It's almost like the Miranda warnings people are able to recite. When you hear that, juxtapose that to the issue of immunity, possibly, whether a president should have absolute immunity. Do you think people believe that it's appropriate for a president to have immunity? I think we're going to have to leave that to the lawyers who are handling the cases. Some would say it's up to the voters to look at issues of who can be on the ballots as well. In places like Colorado or Maine, are you comfortable leaving that up to the courts or to the voters? Those cases are all being litigated, and I'll watch as they go through their process. When you look ahead and you see what is coming down the road, particularly you know, the next time that the calendar date mm -hmm. is January 6th, Madam Vice President, the last time we saw an election year, presidential election year of a vice president overseeing certification of the election, we saw what transpired mm -hmm. with our eyes. There is concern that many actually believe that we do not have free and fair elections in this country. Do you have concerns about how to approach the certification process again on January 6th? I think everyone is right to be vigilant in demanding that we maintain our democracy and we uphold its pillars, which includes the integrity of a free and fair election system. And that means addressing, for example, the intimidation that has happened with poll workers. I was recently in Georgia speaking with poll workers who have been the subject of attack or are fearful about volunteering their time in our elections because they feel a sense of civic duty. It's important for all of us to stand and say we support people who do that work and they should not be attacked. It is important that we all remember that a hallmark of a democracy is civic participation, which means let's all vote. I'm not telling you who to vote for, mm -hmm. but please, in the midst of all that you've got going on, take the time to fill out a ballot. If you can vote by mail, then send it in. Sometimes you might have to stand for quite some time mm -hmm. in line, but please do. In spite of, again, in states like Georgia, who pass laws that make it illegal to even give you food and water if you're standing in line. Uh, but it matters. It matters. And elections matter. The voice of the American people matter. And one of the ways that, that we all express our voice is through our vote. 
Let me ask you one more question. I, it, I'm struck just in your presence. The I was watching you on stage, watching the reactions from the crowd, mm -hmm. looking you in the eye with your passion that you were displaying and talking about so many issues. And yet, you hear candidates suggesting that a vote for President Biden, because of his age, is somehow a vote for you, and that is hurled as an insult. It's intended to demonstrate some negative viewpoint towards you. What is your reaction to this thought that with your background in particular, with your career, that there is some thought that you are incapable? Well, I, th I think that um, most women who have risen in their profession, who are leaders in their profession, have had similar experiences. Mm. Um, I was the first woman to be elected district attorney. I was the first woman to be elected attorney general of the state of California. And I'm the first woman to be vice president. And I love my job. <laughs> Enough said. Thank you so much for the time. I really do appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. Thank you.